evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, latest of our series of exhibition talks relating to our current exhibition, Time and Cosmos in Greco-Roman Antiquity. Uh, my name is Alexander Jones, and I'm currently the interim director at ISA, and I also was the curator of the exhibition. Uh, now, tonight's speaker is, in a sense, the, a textbook counterexample to a, a common perception. Uh, what I'm speaking of is the, the notion that uh, supervising doctoral students is a, a kind of cloning operation in which one seeks to, or in, in, in any case succeeds in producing copies of oneself um, in an academic sense. Uh, Darren was officially my student in the history of science or history and philosophy of science program at the University of Toronto where I used to be before coming here. Uh, and I can say that First of all, he needed really no supervision in reality, except sometimes for the suppression of some pretty appalling jokes that he wanted to put into <laughs> chapter titles and other parts of his dissertation. Uh, but also, he always approached the source material that he was studying with questions that had simply never occurred to me and really had never occurred to the people that I had studied with or that I, uh, I respected as colleagues. I mean, while uh, I and my other friends were looking at questions about, say, the, the great scientist of the Roman Empire, Claudius Ptolemy, of the type like, how did he determine the, uh, how did he determine the eccentricity of the moon's orbit? Darren would be asking a question like, why did Ptolemy ever believe that you could stop a magnet from attracting iron by rubbing it with garlic? Um, so he uh, completed his dissertation, which in a sense leads very nicely into today's talk, because it was uh, an exploration of the entire category of texts and inscriptions uh, that deals with cycles of time in various ways through uh, usually some kind of accounting mechanism, which is often a mechanical one of moving a peg from one hole to another, as in the uh, lost object that he's going to, I presume, talk about the showing for his first slide. Uh, and that came out as a, a wonderful book published by Cambridge Un University Press. Um, and since then, he has also written a very provocative book that uh, essentially forces us to rethink what it means to talk about ancient Roman science, called What Did the Romans Know? Uh, and now he has a book imminent uh, on the history of spontaneous generation. So all very different topics and quite different from what practically anybody else is doing in ancient science. Uh, Anyway, uh, I'm delighted to have him here to come back to uh, territory that for him probably is a, a bit, uh, you know, part of his, he probably feels is a bit of his distant past dealing with the, the calendar cycle materials in our exhibition. Um, but really, no one else knows this material than the way he does. So, Darren. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, and to see Alex again, of course. Um, you did also beat a couple of appalling ideas out of me, uh, not just bad jokes, I have to say. Okay, I, I want to start today by ta thinking about what it is a calendar does or what it is in a calendar encodes. What kinds of time does it measure and what kinds of things do we think important to try and keep track of in a calendar? Uh, I'm also using this pointer for the first time, so I hope I know how to use it. So here we are, Tuesday, December the 1st, 2016, of the Common Era. Uh, sorry, Thursday. It's Thursday. I can't even read. Um, and each of these bits of information in the date encodes something slightly different. The Thursday tells us where we are in a particular cycle. The weekend is coming up. Uh, um, Perhaps there's something going on tomorrow night. I don't know. Uh, um, you know, Wednesday is a certain kind of work day for some people. You have different things you do on different days of the week or whatever. December also encodes a cycle. We know where we are. We know we're going into the winter now. We know that uh, perhaps certain holidays are coming up. Uh, some of you have birthdays that you have to pay attention to. The first is a third cycle within the month of December. It's the beginning of the month, and it'll be followed by the second, followed by the third. You know how many shopping days there are uh, until the holidays or whatever. 2016 tells us how far we are from the beginning of when we started to count in this way. 2000, 
and 16 years ago. It actually is more recent than that, but somebody uh, in the fourth century decided to pin the date back there. Um, but that puts us relative to, if I was to say the date 1952 and talk about something that happened in 1952, you know roughly how far away that is in time because we keep this count running all the time and we always know what year it is. And then the CE just tells us basically we switched uh, to counting on this system and we pin it to a particular date. Before that, it's BCE. Maybe in the future, there'll be a time when we want to start the count again, and we might have eventually a CE, a BCE, and then something else, Anno Trumpy or something. Right? Could be anything. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a Canadian. I just get to go home. <laughs> OK, joking aside, I now want to look at these three different cycles, because they're all slightly different cycles. Um, Thursday and December have similarities. Thursday is a seven day, part of a seven-day cycle that goes over and over and over again, just repeats ad infinitum, and never changes. We don't ever insert a leap Tuesday or anything like that, right? We never need to break up that seven-day cycle. And it's been running constantly for uh, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of years. December, again, runs in a completely predictable cycle. January comes next. Uh, um, February after that, March after that. There are always 12 of these months. But these two cycles run independently of each other. The seven days doesn't fit into the length of any month except February when February has 28 days. Then it fits in perfectly. But other than that, it runs completely independently of the month. And then the third cycle that we have here, the first, we count up to the end of the month and then we start at the first again. But this one is actually a variable cycle because our months can have any of these four different lengths. February is 28 days, except when it's not. Some months are 30, some months are 31. So there's a fair bit going on here, that, that, not particularly complex, but they're all independent cycles that are all working independently of each other. And we need some way of keeping track of that. And we today have various kinds of tools. One of them is the paper wall calendar. And this we all have versions of uh, on our office walls, on our home walls, on our phones, on our computers. And we can see where we are in the cycle. Oh, that's the clicker button. Surprise, something is going to happen. Uh, we're here on the first. And on our paper wall calendars, when we buy them, or this one I downloaded from the internet, I think getprintablecalendars.com, there were a bunch of different choices there. And I picked one that happened to have a few features I wanted to show. And if you look at what people put on their calendars, <coughs> it tells you something about the folks. Uh, first off, this calendar is unusual for me. I don't know how you do things in the States, but this one starts on a Monday. I immediately thought, ah, this is done by somebody in England, because that's what they do in England, right? Um, you'll see in a minute that it definitely was not. But for now, let's, let's hold that there. So they've put down Christmas, so they're marking holidays. They marked Sundays in red, so they're marking Christian holidays here. And maybe they work in retail, and they close their store on those days, I don't know. But again, that's a function of the seven day week, right? This event here called Sunday has certain kinds of implications for some folks. And so we, we mark it specially on the calendar. There's Christmas. For some reason, they've put in two days that are not holidays, but are festive occasions, New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve. You won't see those all the time, but this person has put these on the calendar. We could add festivals in other religions. Hanukkah begins on the 24th this year. So we can put that in. That didn't happen to be in the original, but that is often in calendars. Uh, other kinds of information. I don't know which button to push on this thing anymore. Quite often, you'll see lunar faces thrown in, just out of curiosity. Right? Uh, some people use these as significant. My mother used to run a hobby farm in the wilds of northern Ontario, and she would not uh, she would not plant her potatoes until after the first full moon in June every year. Uh, so this was handy for her. She believed that that produced better potatoes or something. And then. Uh, we have an astronomical phenomenon that shows up on this particular calendar. The first day of winter gets marked by it. So, uh, and that's a significant one that I'll come back to. And then this person has put on uh, Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day, which is not a holiday, uh, as far as I know. Uh, but it's been put on because this person thought it was interesting, whoever made this calendar. So let's look at this first day of winter. The first day of winter is significant because the calendar system that we use today, the Gregorian calendar, the system of inserting a leap year every fourth year, except in a few cases, and I'll talk about those later, keeps our calendar locked on very, very tightly with this event. This event never wanders more than a day from the 21st of December. Our calendar is very efficient at keeping itself pinned down right there. The winter solstice is the event that happens when the sun rises farther south 
if you were looking at the horizon uh, out in the east, the sun will rise farther south on that day than it will any other day in the year, and then it will begin to creep north again, sunrise by sunrise, day by day. It will rise farther and farther north until it gets to its northernmost point, the summer solstice. Sorry, I said summer solstice. I meant winter solstice. Uh, at its northernmost point, it will rise at the summer solstice, and that also means that it has the longest path to go across the sky, which is why the days are longer in the summer than they are in the winter. And so on this diagram of the Earth orbiting the sun, the Earth's going around here, uh, the winter solstice ha in the northern hemisphere happens here, and that's because the Earth is tilted away from the sun. I'll do it here so you can see. The Earth is tilted away from the sun like that, on that kind of an angle. And that means that we're tilted away, and the sun uh, appears to be lower to the horizon, and its rays are coming in at a more inclined angle, and so it doesn't warm us up as much as it normally would. Fortunately for us, uh, this is the stretch of the Earth's orbit where we're going the fastest around the sun, and so the length of time it takes to get from the winter solstice to the vernal equinox is shorter than any other season. So winter is, in fact, the shortest season. Remember that in mid-February. And this is just a diagram of how those four points line up to each other. It makes a nice, exact, right-angled uh, um, opposition there. So the Gregorian calendar that we use that wants to pin, we actually prioritize this. We didn't have to do that. We could have decided it was fine for December to, to wander around, to slip out of line with the winter solstice. But we decided it was important to keep, somebody did somewhere, it was important to keep December 21st more or less locked onto the winter solstice. And a series of calendar reforms have got us to the point where we have a very good calendar now for that. The next time we're going to need to fix it, we're going to have to stick in an extra day in about 1,000 years just to nudge it back into place. The Gregorian calendar was introduced in 1582 by Pope Gregory XIII and was adopted slowly uh, by different countries. Catholic, Roman Catholic countries adopted it immediately. England took a little longer. Some other countries took even longer. Um, uh, Russia, for example, didn't adopt it until the Communist Revolution of 1918. But now the world mostly um, uh, uses the Gregorian calendar. And you know it, you're very familiar with it. It follows the older Julian calendar quite closely, 365 days. You throw in a leap day every fourth year. And the innovation that Pope Gregory's astronomers introduced was that you took out three four hundredths of a day. You took three, day, three days, three years out of 400, and you don't put in that extra day, that leap year, that February 29th. And the way it works is that any year that ends in 00, so 1900, 1600, 1400, well, it came in in 1500, so it would have to be later than that, but 1900 or 1600, any of those 100 years, if they're divisible by 0, then they are a leap year. Otherwise, they're not. So um, in 1900, February only had 28 days, even though it was divisible by 4. This is Pope Gregory's rule, and that keeps our calendar efficient. Uh, and it's just that, that much more efficient than the old Julian calendar. And so 2000 was a leap year just like we expected it to be because it is divisible by 400. So 1700 was not, 1800 was not, 1900 was not, 2000 was. If any of us are fortunate enough to make it to 2100, it will not be a leap year. If your birthday is on February 29th, you're going to have to wait. Okay. But this is not the only astronomical phenomenon being marked on the calendar. The other one is, of course, the new moons, and they are closely connected to this particular holiday, right? Hanukkah begins on the 25th of Kislev in the Hebrew calendar, and the reason that this date is the 25th of Kislev is because that date there had been the first of Kislev, which is the first visibility of the new moon crescent after the new moon that happened on Tuesday the 29th uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning or something like that. So the first visibility gives us the first day of the month in the Hebrew calendar. But lunar months are not the same length as um, uh, calendar months. From the 29th to the 29th here happens to be 30 days, but sometimes those two events are 29 days apart. They're never 31 or 28. They're always 29 or 30, and that doesn't fit most of our calendar months. And so that means the lunar calendar that's determining the date of Hanukkah moves around with respect to uh, and you see this every year because the date of Hanukkah shifts around, moves around with respect to the calendar we're using. So lunar calendars have this extra feature where they have to have some different mechanism than the Gregorian calendar if they want to keep themselves even loosely locked on to that astronomical seasonal event, the first day of winter. 
And this is a problem that's faced by Greek calendars. This is the why, why I'm talking about it. Greek and Roman calendars handle these sets of problems differently. And they have different priorities for what they want the calendar to do. If we look at the dates of Hanukkah uh, over the next few years, you'll notice that Hanukkah always falls in December or just at the end of November. It moves around back and forth. So 2016, it's on the 24th of December. It's going to go back by, uh, uh, what is that, 12 days uh, for 2017. It's going to go back by 10 days for 2018. And then it's going to come forward again. How did it do that? Right? We'll talk about this system. The reason is that in 20, uh, 2019, the Hebrew calendar will insert an extra month in the same way that the Gregorian calendar inserts an extra day. So insert an extra month, and that makes your year longer. That year has 13 lunar months in it. Contrast this with the Muslim calendar, which does not prioritize keeping itself locked onto the seasons. If you look at the start of Ramadan from 2016 through to 2021, you'll see that year by year it moves backwards by about 11 days year after year after year after year. And over the course of a person's lifetime, it will go all the way around. It'll be in the winter, it'll be in the summer, and it'll be in the winter again, um, two or even three times, depending on how long the person lives. And that's just fine. The folks using that calendar are perfectly happy to have that do that. They could bring in an intercalation system to have it do something like uh, the Hebrew calendar does, but they don't. They, ch they have chosen not to, and so they do not. And we could look at other lunar calendars that are in practice, uh, in use today. The Chinese New Year does something more like Hanukkah. You'll see it's always sort of mid-January to mid-February. And that's because, again, it intercalates. It sticks in extra months here and there. It uses a very different system than the Hebrew calendar. Um, and there are several systems available, of course. OK, so now I want to look at the ancient Greek calendar that was lunar and that had to deal with some of the issues I've been talking about. But as soon as I say, what is the ancient Greek calendar, I have to do a correction and say, what are the ancient Greek calendars? And it's a quirk that has always sort of puzzled me that the ancient Greek cities all used different calendars. True, when a city like Athens sent out a colony, a bunch of Athenians all moving to a new place together, they tended to bring with them the Athenian calendar or a version of it, but then they made changes. They developed their own uh, ritual traditions and so on. And so you can see clusters of calendars that are related to each other, but I don't think any two are identical. So here's the Athenian calendar. Uh, like the Hebrew calendar, it has 12 or 13 months. Sometimes you stick in that extra month. They wanted to keep the first of Hecatombion locked onto an astronomical phenomenon more or less loosely. And the names are, um, even if you're used to reading Greek names, they're, they're quite difficult. You have to sort of get your mouth around them. My Mactarion, Pian Epsion, they're very, very unusual names. And what they wanted to lock, the Athenians wanted to lock uh, the first of Hecatombion down to was more or less the summer solstice. And they made it so that the first of Hecatombion would be begin at dawn, because Greek days began at dawn. Ours begin at midnight. Uh, Hebrew uh, calendar days begin at sunset. You can pick the beginning of your day for your calendar as well. Greek days begin at dawn. So it, the he first of Hecatombion is the first morning after the first new moon after the summer solstice. And if it moves off from that, you stick another month in to push it back to where it needs to be. Okay. Now, if we compare this, just to see how different different Greek calendar systems were, let's compare this to the calendar from the Antikythera mechanism. And you can see a little video about the Antikythera mechanism in the exhibition uh, downstairs. I forget what floor we're on now. You can see that the month names are entirely independent of the Athenian month names. There are no overlap. There is no overlap whatsoever. Um, not every Greek city-state would even begin their calendar at the same time of year. Not everybody thought the summer solstice was New Year's. Some people thought it was other dates, other times of year, other times relative to uh, agricultural seasons, and so on. And um, uh, Sorry, I just got scrambled for a second. I'm back. Um, Let's look at where the month names here come from. So this is an inscription at Athens, uh, from Athens. And it includes festivals, lists of what the festivals are for each of these months, uh, insofar as it has, I mean, it's broken and so stuff is missing. But we have a fair bit of material here. And so I want to zoom in on this little section here 
for the month of Munichion there. And you can see as soon as I translate or put up the translation for uh, the text that follows the month name here, you'll see where the name comes from. So in the month of Munichion, uh, the Athenians were supposed to sacrifice a full-grown victim for Artemis of Munichia. This is a, a port at the Piraeus, one of the ports in the Piraeus. A triple offering at the sanctuary of Pythian Apollo and a piglet for the nurse mother. And it goes on. There's all kinds of animals for all kinds of different gods. But typically, the month names for a Greek city would, would point to a festival that was held in that month uh, for the city. Now, the Athenian calendar intercalates, sticks in its extra months. Um, it looks like it was systematic, but we don't fully understand what the system was. And there are stories kicking around that sometimes they messed with the calendar, and there is some evidence for this, in ways that caused problems for uh, keeping it locked onto the seasons. Um, there is a story from the third century BC uh, that at, at Athens, there was a festival that was supposed to happen on the 10th of the month, Elaphabolion, and the dramatic troupe, who was supposed to be performing the ceremony, the, performing a drama, which was a ceremony, hadn't arrived yet. So the archons got together, and they made the next day the 9th of Elaphabolion as well, and the day after that, the 9th of Elaphabolion. And they did this until the guys showed up, at which point they said, tomorrow's the 10th. And the calendar went on. And we have actually um, some inscriptions that will say this particular date that I'm telling you now is according to the moon, which we think means a real lunar calendar. And sometimes it says this date is according to the archon. So we think there might have been a, a kind of second calendar running over the lunar calendar that looked a lot like the lunar calendar, but that was used for civic purposes or something like that. What little we know about the Athenian intercalation systems is contrasted very sharply by the very clever intercalation system that we find on the Antikythera mechanism. So here are the month names uh, on the mechanism, and I want to have a look at how they work. The Antikythera mechanism works by using a 19-year cycle, uh, calculations for the date of uh, Easter uh, and some of the ways in which the Hebrew calendar work also rely on uh, a 19 year cycle of one sort or another. The Athenians were using, uh, or sorry, the Antikythera mechanism was using a 19 year cycle and taking advantage of the fact that after 19 years, and I've just collected the first new moons for a bunch of years here, after 19 years, relative to the solstices and equinoxes, and in this case I'm just going to substitute in the Gregorian calendar because it's pretty close. Um, the cycle begins to repeat itself. The first new moon happens uh, very, very close to the same astronomical event. So let's call the astronomical event whatever it is that happens on the 16th of January. That's not significant, but we'll pick one. And you can see that the first new moon happens again 19 years later, 19 years later. We can pick any one of these dates. Here we go across, and it's very, very close. So the 19-year cycle is a really good catch uh, of a recurring set of new moons. And so we know from historians, or sorry, from historical sources, Geminis uh, of Rhodes wrote a book called Introduction to the Phenomena, uh, and he tells us that some astronomers at Athens in the fifth century came up with a 19-year cycle. They noticed that this was happening, and then they formalized it in such a way that, uh, so from, I'm going to use uh, the Athenian 19-year cycle here. Uh, made by Meton of Athens or his followers. And I'm going to look at the length of time from this new moon here to the night before that new moon there. So from January 16th, 1961 to January 16th, 1980, just before the new moon happens on January 17th. That is 19 years, which is equal to 6,940 days. Meton of Athens seems to have calculated this out. And then he systematized, or his followers, we don't know exactly who did this, systematized it so that in that 6,940 days, the 235 lunar months that happen, uh, we're going to count 125 days as, uh, sorry, 125 months as 30 days long, and a lesser number, just slightly less, uh, at 29. And it turns out the lunar month is just over 29 and a half days long, which is why there's that imbalance there. So he, he dictated that 125 months are going to be 30 days long, 110 or 29. And seven of these years in that 19-year cycle are going to have 13 new moons. And all the rest of those years are going to have 12. 
And this is the system that we find in the Antikythera mechanism, except that they do something very, very clever. In order to get 110, day, 110 months of 29 days, you have to, somewhere in here, 110 times pull a day out of the calendar. Or once, pull a whole month out of the calendar. Three times, pull a whole month out of the calendar. There's some way you've got to get those days out of the calendar. It's the opposite of the Gregorian calendar. Instead of putting days in, we now have to take days out. And Geminis tells us that what Meton proposed was since if you take 110 and you divide it into 6,940, you end up with um, the number 63. And so if we pull a day out every 63rd day, no matter what month it is, no matter what else has been happening, we just pull a day out, we would end up building this system and having our calendar fit in over the 19 years in a nice, neat way. And I argued in an earlier publication that that was absolutely impossible, that nobody would ever have done that, and it was silly. Uh, and here it is on the Antikythera mechanism. I've never been so delighted to be proved wrong in my life. The Antikythera mechanism has a really lovely presentation for its calendar. The face of the calendar is really quite interesting. It's a machine, and a dial turns, just like on a modern clock, except that the dial, instead of simply pointing to 12 o'clock or something like that. It instead locks into a spiral groove that goes all the way around the circle and then comes back again in the second spiral, all the way around, comes back in again on the third spiral, and it does that five times. And so at each time, wherever that pin is, so it's now part way around, almost at the end of its first spiral, you would read off, that's the month name there. And so you know what month you're in. And you look in this box here, these sets of boxes here. If there's nothing written, that's a 30-day month. And if there's a number written in, then you pull out that day. And so each of these, you pull out the first in the month of uh, Foinikaios here. Uh, 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 you pull out the fifth of Lanotropios, and so on all the way around. But you do the same thing again for this month, this month, this month. First, nothing. Fifth, nothing. Ninth, nothing. First, nothing. Fifth, nothing. Ninth, nothing, et cetera all of the way around. And so this is, a, this is a really lovely display for showing how you could quickly, as it were, calculate, uh, or see at least, this calendar in action. And it turns out to work, even still. If we pull dates out of our 19-year cycle that I showed you, um, we get the beginning of 1977 right here, A D or C E 1977. And the, it's the correct lengths of lunar months, from what I pulled off of NASA. We have 30, 29, 30, 30, 29, 30, 29, and so on. And not only is it good for 1977, it's good for 1996, it was good for 2015, and good for 2034. So in 2017, we're down around here somewhere now. If we were to, I'd have to count the 12s, but anyway, you get the idea. So very, very nice system for doing this. We don't know what the Athenians were doing particularly, or exactly, uh, but the Antikythera mechanism, anyway, was using this astronomical set of cycles to try and determine how uh, the months would be laid out. I now want to look at the Roman calendar, which is a very different beast. And as soon as we start to talk about the Roman calendar, we're going to start to recognize features of the modern Gregorian calendar because it is in many ways the ancestor, or the direct ancestor of the Gregorian calendar. So to begin with, I want to look at the first entry in the date formula I had up earlier, that Thursday. Thursday, December 1st, 2016. So let's hone in on that and see how this works. The days of the week. Why are our days of the week the way they are? Why do we have seven of them? Why? It turns out there's a good reason for them to be in the particular order they are in. The reason the days of the week are organized the way they are has everything to do with the distances of the planets from the Earth back when we used to live in the center of the universe and all the stars and planets orbited around us, which is to say, in antiquity, in this geocentric system. Ancient astronomers decided that the way that you knew how far away a planet was, and we're counting the moon and the sun as planets, was how quickly uh, they moved through the sky, what their average speed was. Uh, around the, zo the zodiac. And so the moon goes around once a month. That's way faster than any of the other planets. So it must have been the closest to us. Mercury whips back and forth in front of the sun at quite a high rate of speed. It must be the next planet up. Venus is still a little slower, but it sometimes goes faster than the sun. It must be the third planet out. The sun is next. 
And then Mars, which takes longer to go around. Jupiter takes 12 years to go all the way around the zodiac. And Saturn takes 30. So Saturn is at the outside. So there they are. That's the order of the planets. The moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. If you need a mnemonic for that, uh, my mother's very silly monkey just spoke. By the time you've done that, you then realize you have to memorize three Ms, which means you're halfway there already. You might as well just memorize the order. <laughs> so there they are in their order. Now, when ancient astrology was beginning to take a toehold in the uh, Greco-Roman world, sometime around the first century BC, astrology started to uh, saturate ancient ways of thinking about the universe. Um, astrological forces were thought to be active in people's lives and down here on Earth. And we don't know who did this, but at some point, somebody uh, came up with a theory that each of these planets, in turn, would rule over or had power over each hour of the day. So I'm going to start on the traditional beginning of the Roman week on uh, the day that Saturn ruled over the first hour of. And like uh, if you've ever bought a wineskin, whatever wine you put into it the first time, that flavor never really goes away. Right? There's proverbs for this, I think. Uh, that's the idea here as well. Saturn colors the whole day, no matter what comes next. So the second hour is ruled by Jupiter. So we're just going through the order of the planets here. First hour ruled by Saturn, next hour ruled by Jupiter, the next hour ruled by Mars, then the Sun, then Venus, then Mercury, the Moon. But because Saturn ruled over the first hour, it colors the whole day. The next hour is ruled by Jupiter, but in a Saturn-y kind of way. Right? Then Mars, but still pretty Saturn-y. And as we come to the end of the cycle, you'll see just because 7 and 24 have this particular relationship, if you try to do 7 of anything in 24 hours once an hour, we come back to Saturn in the 22nd hour. That's a really Saturn-y time of day. 10 o'clock Saturday night. The emergency rooms are full. Right? Now, now you know why. Uh, then Jupiter rules, then Mars. And so we continue now. The very first hour of the next day is ruled by the Sun. So we go from Saturn's day to the Sun's day. And we can continue in this way to get to the Moon and so on. Right? You just basically skip two planets each time. Saturn, then the Sun, then the Moon, then Mars, uh, then Mercury, then uh, Jupiter, and then Venus. And that gives us the order of our days of the week. And English has a particular quirk where we take um, the Roman name for the month, or for the day, I should say, and call it Saturn's Day still. It's still the day of Saturn. Then we take the English name for the two planets, Sunday and Monday is just a shortening of Moon Day. Uh, and then we go French. Mardi, mercredi. No, we don't actually. We, we go to uh, Norse. But if we look at the French, we can see the connection still, right? Mars Day, Mercury Day, Jupiter, Jove, right? That other name for Jupiter, and Venus's Day. But English pulls in these Norse gods. We're following a, a Germanic tradition here. Uh, we pull in these Norse gods for the last four days of the week. And so we have Tuesday, Woden's Day, Thor's Day, and Freya's Day. And these gods were seen as roughly equivalents uh, for the uh, Roman counterparts. And if you go downstairs and have a look at the exhibit, you will see these days of the week on quite a number of the exhibits down there. It's really delightful to see how many of them uh, I saw has managed to bring in. So my favorite of the bunch, uh, just because I have an emotional attachment to it, um, is the, uh, what is known as the Latium Parapegma. This is a really beautiful piece of marble. Uh, it's broken. We only have the right hand third of it, plus not the top corners. Uh, but you can see what we have of it lets us reconstruct this whole cycle across here, because we can see Jovis uh, of Jupiter. Right? We know it's the day of Jupiter. We can see the shortened Mercur here uh, and the beginning of Venus's day. Uh, so we know that across the top here, those holes, well, there's only one hole there now, but there would have been seven holes, and there would have been somebody who moved a peg every single day, so you know what day of the week it is. You can just glance at the pegboard, and you say, oh, it's Venus's day, or oh, it's Saturn's day. And it keeps track of a couple of other cycles that I'll look at in a moment. And so this is a tool for tracking the seven-day week. The Romans don't have cheap paper. They don't have paper at all. So they can't make wall calendars that you can just throw away at the end of the year. That's too expensive. So you carve something in, particularly this person was wealthy, but there are graffito versions of these. There, it runs up and down the whole socioeconomic spectrum. This is an expensive one, but it didn't have to be. 
and then you can keep track of it that way. And some people have something like this in their homes. Anybody who is of Dutch ancestry or has Dutch friends, you will possibly have seen a Vajardegs calendar, pardon my pronunciation, a birthday calendar. It's a permanent calendar, and people, you write people's birthdays on it. It includes February 29th, and it's kind of like that. It's a permanent way of tracking uh, certain kinds of movable phenomena. And um, we, it looks like from its original publication that that corner actually got lost sometime since the 18th century, because in its first publication, uh, the whole corner appears to be there still, so it might have gotten banged or something uh, in the 300 years since then. On the other hand, I don't think there's enough room to write Wenner, V-E-N-E-R, in this amount of space. Right? There's only three letters under it of the same size, so I'm not sure whether this is actually accurate. I, I, there may have originally been more of the word Venus there than there is now, but anyway. This is a reconstruction of the whole thing, and you can see how pretty it would have been right, with this rosette in the middle. And again, uh, we're tracking other cycles here. Um, every day you move a peg from one to two to three to four to five to six to seven. This is tracking uh, the days since new moon or full moon, one or the other. So it's tracking a lunar cycle. And manually, you would just have to decide, using some system, we don't know what they were using, whether to stop at 29 or whether to stop at 30 and go back to one again. And down the right-hand side is something kind of interesting. Uh, this is the older, so we have the seven-day week across the top. That's the new week, right? That's the fancy new one that came in in the first century BC. There is a much older eight-day Roman week that is tied by its names to different cities. And people think this might have had something to do with market days. In Wico means in the marketplace here. Um, so this might have been the local market day, and then nominally at least, the market day would have been at Interamna the next day, Minterna the day after that, Rome, Capua, Cassini, and so on. So there's this eight-day week. It's even more complex than ours. They're tracking a seven-day week plus an eight-day week plus the lunar phases. Um, and they also mention some astronomical phenomena. Whoops. I'll come back to that. Okay. Here's another example from my title screen. And this is one that was just carved in a wall plaster uh, in a, a room that was off of the baths of Trajan at Rome. And so somebody with very little money indeed just carved their own version of this. And here are the days of the lunar month going down the sides here. There are the gods of the seven day week across the top. And again, there's no end of these things downstairs. There are half a dozen things with the gods of the seven day week going across the top uh, that are worth looking at. And then this particular parapegma uh, also, these are called parapegmata. I can't remember if I said that. This particular one also tracks either the sun or the moon in its motion through uh, the zodiac. Okay, so back to the Latium Parapegma. It also tells us when the seasons begin. Winter here begins on the 10th day before the calends of November, and it runs until the 14th day before the calends of February, and it tells us how many days that is. And notice that it's pointing to days in a calendar that looks a lot like ours. So this is probably post Julian calendar reform. Before the Julian calendar reform, you would not carve in stone what day in your calendar winter was going to begin on because the calendar moved around too much. So let's look at how that Julian calendar works. Again, there's a very, very lovely inscription downstairs that has a snapshot of the Roman calendar on it. Now, we're used to the format that I showed you before uh, of a wall calendar, a paper wall calendar. This one will take a little unpacking. But you'll see a couple of noticeable features that'll be recognizable, right? There's a month called August, Augusti. Uh, oh, I think that E is actually extra. No, it is not, okay. Uh, and then September here, you can just see the B before it breaks off. So they're using the same calendar as ours. And the fact that there's a month called August tells us that this came in after Augustus uh, instituted his calendar reform. Like the calendar I showed you earlier, uh, oh, sorry, it has numbers. Um, it counts, uh, and the way that a Roman calendar counts is instead of saying the first, the second, the third, it has these three special days, the calends, the knowns, and the ides, you'll remember from Shakespeare, and instead of counting up to those days, you'll notice you count down. So we go from the eighth to the seventh to the sixth to the fifth to the fourth to the third to the day before, and then here are the ides here. So we have the calends, we have the knowns, and the ides, and we count down from each of those, and then from the Ides, we count down to the next calends. So from here, this is the 19th day before the calends of September over there. 
it keeps track of the week. There is an eight day cycle that goes from A to H and then begins at A again. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, and then A again. And that is just this Roman eight day week. And the way it works is because on an inscription, your eight day week, well, outside of inscriptions, the eight day week never fits in with the entire Julian calendar year. January 1st doesn't always happen on a Tuesday. You need some way of keeping track of that, uh, the cycle. So the way it works is on January 1st, on the calends of January, you pay attention to which day in the eight day week we're at. So let's say it's Minturna. January 1st this year, calends of January, we're on the day called Minturni. That day was labeled with an A. Now, for the rest of the year, anytime you hit an A, that's a Minturni day. The next day is a Romai day. The next day is a Capuai day. The next day is a Cassini day. And you just need to pay attention on the 1st of January to which day you're in the site, which day of the week it is in this cycle, eight day cycle, and that will tell you your A's and B's and C's for the rest of the year. There are other calendars in existence that have a second set of letters with the seven day cycle right beside the first one. So January 1st begins AA, the second is BB, and so on until you get to HA, and then it falls out again and goes around. It does work. It's not a bad solution to a problem that you otherwise wouldn't be able to solve. And we include holidays, just like the calendar I showed you earlier. So this is a festival of spes, hope, space, I should say, in the Forum Holatorium. So there's a festival on the calends of August in this particular location if you want to go out there. It also tells us right underneath that that it's the birthday of Tiberius Claudius Germanicus. Um, this is a bit like the Pearl Harbor Remembrance. Um, actually, there's something right under it that's more like the Pearl Harbor Remembrance, uh, but I didn't highlight it. Uh, there is a holiday because on this day, Julius Caesar conquered nearer Spain. I didn't highlight that in the box, but I should have thought of it. Okay, and then finally, we have uh, a list of letters that tell us essentially which days are weekdays and which days are weekends, as it were. Any day marked with an F is a dies fastus, fastus. Courts can do business on those days. Any day marked with an N is a dies nefastus. Courts cannot do business on those days. So that's like a weekend, as it were, right? And a, uh, a C marks a dies comitialis. Uh, which is uh, the days on which assemblies can meet. So we've got all kinds of information packed in here, just as we see in the modern calendar. It's performing many of the same functions as what I talked about earlier. But now I want to look at this Augusta. Augusta. How did August get into the calendar? What has it got to do with the Emperor Augustus? Well, this is everything to do with the calendar reform I talked about earlier, to try and keep the calendar pinned down to the uh, the uh, uh, solstices and equinoxes. In the old Roman calendar, um, this month was called sext sextilis. January, February, March, April, May, June, quintilis, sextilis, September, October, November, and december. November, I should say. And you can see here, uh, possibly, that we start getting into number words, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth. And that's led people to speculate, even as far back as the ancient Romans, that the beginning of the year used to be in March before it got moved to January. Uh, and that is possible. And in the old calendar, uh, January had 29 days, February 28, March 31, April 29, and so on, giving us a total of 355 days. It's quite close to the lunar year, uh, but not quite close enough. It's one uh, day off from the average lunar year. And so it fell out of sync with the seasons quite quickly. Intercalation was done sporadically, as far as we can tell. You throw in a month whenever you think you need one uh, without any system whatsoever. So when Julius Caesar came along, he decided to fix the calendar, and he instituted the forebearer of our own calendar, which is, uh, oh, I forgot to tell you how they, when they did intercalate, they did this weird thing. Um, there's February clicking along, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th. When you decide that you need to stick an extra month in, what you do is you break February up between the 23rd or the 24th, sometimes between the 24th and the 25th. You throw in an extra month of 27 days, and then you come back to February 24th again. So the day after the 21st is the calends of the extra month, then you start counting down and you come back on the 24th and finish up February uh, and move into March from there. Crazy, crazy system. Caesar decided to fix it, and fix it he did. 
So he brought in a new calendar. Uh, he added extra days to January, uh, to April, to June, and a bunch of other months to bring it up to 365 days. This starts to look familiar now. And he instituted the rule that every fourth year, you stick in a day. And so that's what they did. And they now have a year of 365 and a quarter days long. And that's really pretty good. It took 1,500 years before anybody decided that that needed to be fixed. Uh, so it's quite a good system. I say that, it turns out that uh, there's still another correction that needs to be done. Um, okay, before I move to the other correction, I should tell you that because Juli Julius Caesar uh, was so clever as to fix the calendar, and because the Senate wanted to make him feel good, because otherwise you might end up dead, uh, they renamed the month of Quintilis, and they named it after him. They called it Julius, uh, which is our July. So it, you notice here as the Romans are counting down, something funny is happening. Uh, I don't know if you can read it from the back of the room, but that number says it's the eighth day before the Ides, seventh, sixth, fifth, fourth, third, day before, and then the Ides. Fourth, third, the day before, and the Ides. There's a day missing there. The Romans count funny. When a, oh, I, I blew it up for you, aren't I clever? When a Roman does something every fourth day, this is how they do it. They say, okay, I'll start today, I'll do it today. I'm gonna, I don't know, wash my hair. I'm gonna wash my hair every fourth day. I don't do it tomorrow, I don't do it the next day. Then I do it again, that's now my first day again. Second day, third day, fourth day, that's now my first day again. Second day, third day, fourth day. So they intercalated, they put in a February 29th on this schedule. Every fourth day, because that's what they were told to do. Augustus comes along, notices that the solstice has moved, and he smacks somebody in the head and says, silly, you need to do it every fifth day. Um, this is quite possibly a cross-cultural communication problem. If Babylonian astronomers uh, were explaining the system uh, to uh, Romans, then quite possibly this was a communication error. They didn't know Romans didn't know how to count. So they move from every fourth day. So this is, the, in fact, it's 365 and a third days is what they're doing. So Augustus comes along and fixes it, and he has them intercalate every fifth day. Uh, and in his honor, they, of course, renamed the month Sextilis Augustus. And with that, we have the modern calendar with the exception of the Gregorian reform in 1582 that pulls out those, extra, those three extra leap days every 400 years. Uh, and so you can see the structures of particularly the Roman calendar because it's so much the uh, ancestor of our own. You can see the structure of that Roman calendar reflected in our, our own calendar. But also you see the ways in which different time cycles are being handled the priority to incorporate all of these different kinds of time cycles, and the ways in which uh, festivals and other kinds of things, political events, are uh, commemorated mirror very much the way we use our own calendar today. Thank you very much.